Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, an episode on Ukrainian political parties. So today's episode was requested by Hugo Ionis, VV, C. Kadia, and Druzda After Party, all on YouTube. If you want me to do another country's political parties, please either request it down below, send me an email, or put a request in the feedback and request form in the description. I currently have requests to do German parties, Zimbabwean parties, I think that's how you say it, uh, Moldovan parties, South Korean parties, Moroccan parties, Chilean parties, Swiss parties, Iranian parties, Mexican parties, Slovenian parties, and many more. Talking about Ukrainian political parties is difficult. Talking about a country's politics through their political parties will always have a shelf life, as situations can and do change, and parties are always changing or even outright disappearing. However, for Ukraine, since the Russian invasion, it is very difficult to get a firm sense of where Ukrainian parties are, and ordinary politics have been put on hold somewhat. An election was supposed to be held this year in Ukraine, but since around 20% of the country is occupied by Russia, and the war is still very much raging, it seems unlikely to actually occur. I'd imagine that no matter what happens, if Ukraine wins, is partitioned, or there is some sort of peace deal reached, Ukrainian political parties won't remain stagnant, and pretty big changes will likely occur. I say all this to say that there is a very real possibility that this episode will age like milk, or just be completely irrelevant in even a couple of days, depending on the course of the war. Historically, Ukrainian parties and politicians were notorious for holding little ideology and being corrupt. One politician, Yulia Timoshenko, described in a press conference in the late 2000s that political parties in the country were less of ideological groups and more of leadership teams, representing the supporters of a couple of politicians. This is not unique for Ukraine. As we have talked about in the Philippines, Brazil, and Nigeria parties episode, parties in these countries all have parties with little or limited ideology. Often in Ukraine, the only real dividing line between parties would be their position on Ukraine geopolitically, either arguing for closer cooperation with the West or Russia. To a certain extent, in the late 2010s after the Euro Maiden revolution, this seems to have altered. Most large parties have somewhat of an ideology, or at the very least have tried to present themselves as having more of an ideology, but it still is often very vague and corruption is still present. Ukraine's legislature is the Vrkhovna Rada, or Supreme Council. The Rada is made up of 450 MPs who are elected via two ways. Half are elected from proportional representation with a 5% electoral threshold. The other half are elected from 225 constituencies found throughout the country with whichever candidate gets the most votes becoming that constituency's MP. In the 2019 election, 26 constituencies were under the control of the Russian government, or the separatist republics, so effectively, at the start of the 2019 session, there were only 424 MPs. The Rada will vote on rules and regulations, appoint certain political officials into office, like the prime minister, the second most important political figure in the country, can change the constitution, and can impeach the president. So the largest and cruel ruling party of Ukraine is the Servant of the People, or Sluha Naruda, or SN. As I'm sure many of you know, SN was named after a comedy TV show of the same name that portrayed comedian Volodymyr Zelensky as a teacher who became president after he rants about corruption in Ukraine. Again, as I'm sure many of you will know, Zelensky would then become president of Ukraine in 2019, running on an anti-corruption platform. The party represents his supporters and ideologically has been called many things, ranging from populist, to liberal, to libertarian, to neoliberal, to Ukrainian nationalist. The party itself defines its ideology as, quote, Ukrainian centrism. The party in 2019 got the most support from those upset with the status quo and corruption in the country, and geographically did best in more rural regions, and generally in central and somewhat eastern Ukraine. It currently has 240 MPs. It is headed by Yelena Shulyak, an MP. Both President Zelensky and Prime Minister Denis Shimal, while seemingly not officially members of the party, are closely connected to it. SN's Ukrainian centrism is described by the party as not representing any sort of political extreme, saying it rejects right and left, nationalism and separatism, and just wants pragmatic decisions. However, it also below this lists its policy goals, which pretty firmly aligns it with liberalism. It talks about supporting a market economy, limiting government monopolies, 
decentralization for local governments, ending corruption, respecting the, quote, historical and cultural heritage of Ukrainian people, unquote, and is pro-EU. Zelensky himself has previously indicated his support towards more socially progressive policies, like civil unions for same-sex couples, is pro-choice, and has signed gambling legislation in 2020. The party is also in favor of cracking down on illegal construction, deregulating the economy, and aligning more with NATO. Zelensky, while running for office, was initially accused of being controlled by the oligarchs, despite his promise to clean up corruption. Servant of the People was, after all, on a TV channel controlled by Ukrainian oligarchs, and Zelensky's campaign was accused of illegal campaign practices, by both advertising his show and his presidential campaign at the same time. While Zelensky has attempted to crack down on the country's oligarchs, making it harder for them to recover their assets taken by the state, Zelensky himself has been accused of corruption, with the Pandora Papers revealing he had several undeclared offshore assets. SN itself has several members who have been accused of corruption, and apparently SN has a problem with members of the party regularly abandoning the party line, meaning that while they technically have a majority of the Rada, they de facto have to work with other parties in order to get policy passed. This also is a sign that while SN promised to break the mold of traditional Ukrainian politics, in practice, they may have been just like the many other parties that have promised to fix the country. Interestingly enough, Historically, Zelensky was accused by his opponents as not only being controlled by the oligarchs, but also by Russia itself, with Zelensky for a while not being very good at speaking Ukrainian, calling Ukraine separatist rebels and not terrorists, and the oligarch Zelensky was aligned with also having close ties with Russia. I'll talk a bit more about this later, but Zelensky has been accused by the Russian government and pro-Russian outlets of being a Nazi or friendly with Nazis, and being a dictator, banning opposition parties. I'll talk a bit more about both of those later when I'm talking about Svoboda and Opposition Platform for Life. However, let's go to the largest opposition party right now, European Solidarity, or Yes. Proniska Solidarnost, or YES. YES was founded in 2000 by, at the time, MP Petro Poroshenko. Poroshenko would largely abandon the party after 2003, and go on to be a minister in several Ukrainian governments in the 2000s, and would grow a business empire. In 2014, after the Euromaidan protest, Poroshenko would revamp the party and win the presidential election. Yes was seen then, and really today, as a party for Poroshenko and his allies. It won in 2014, largely carried by Poroshenko's ability to spend millions on advertising himself, him aligning himself with the West, along with being an experienced politician. Poroshenko tried to win a second term as president in 2019, but was beaten by Zelensky, which we will talk about a bit later. In the 2014 and 2019 presidential election and the 2019 parliamentary elections, Poroshenko and the party did best generally in western Ukraine, Kiev, and in the diaspora. It currently has 27 MPs. It is headed by Poroshenko, who is currently serving as an MP. Yes is seen somewhat as a center-right conservative party, in the vein of parties like FI in Italy or PP in Spain. It is seen as favoring a liberal economy and is pro-EU. Poroshenko, while in office, did more to move the country closer towards the EU. He promoted decentralization, encouraged the Ukrainian language to be spoken more, for example, introducing language quotas to radio and TV stations, helped facilitate the creation of a united Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and sought to strengthen the Ukrainian army to combat separatists in the Donbass. While Poroshenko was able to do quite a bit in Ukraine, he also failed to really transform the country. Corruption was very much present in Poroshenko's Ukraine. Poroshenko himself has been accused of corruption, with him spending lavishly on himself and others while in office, having ties to oligarchs, and being named in both the Panama and Pandora Papers. While the Euro maiden protests promised a new political system, Poroshenko really failed to change the system too much, besides align the country more with the West, which is what led Poroshenko to lose the presidential election, as Zelensky promised a new vision while Poroshenko could only promise his experience in a corrupt system. I'd also imagine that since Poroshenko got more support among the diaspora and Kiev, it is possible Poroshenko and Yes are viewed as a party for the rich and not for poor rural Ukrainians. Next we go to the All-Ukrainian Union Fatherland, or Zeo-Ukrainska Obdienia Batkivshina, or hopefully something like that. Batkivshina was founded in 1999 and is based around Timoshenko, who I mentioned at the start. She has been involved in Ukrainian politics since then and has served as Prime Minister briefly in 2005 and then again from 2007 to 2010. She was noted for being one of the most vocal advocates for Ukraine to move towards the West and of reforming the country, being involved in both the Orange Revolution in 2004 and Euromaiden in 2014. It seems her popularity has somewhat diminished since 2014, 
but she and her faction still remain as an important bloc in the Rada. She, in the 2019 parliamentary and presidential election, got the most support generally in western and northern Ukraine. Batkivshina currently has 24 MPs. Timoshenko currently is a MP. Batkivshina tends to be defined as center-right and conservative. However, Timoshenko actually, in a conference when she was prime minister, defined her party as leftist. It is pro-Western, favoring closer cooperation with both the EU and NATO, and Timoshenko has historically fought against pro-Russian politicians. It also is in favor of anti-corruption policies, wants to raise Ukrainian salaries to that of the European level, wants to raise pensions, and is in favor of mandatory medical insurance. Also, in the conference I talked about earlier, she was introduced by saying that Margaret Thatcher was the Timoshenko of the UK, which points to the fact that Timoshenko, while Prime Minister, did generally support privatization. Batkivshina and Timoshenko, while historically being quite important in Ukrainian politics, aren't as powerful as they once were. Since Euromaiden, Timoshenko has been sidelined by newer politicians. A big explanation for this is while Timoshenko presented herself as a reformer in the 2000s, she actually initially became famous in the 1990s as an oligarch, controlling a large business empire. She also in 2010 was in prison due to corruption, and while it is likely she was persecuted because of her politics aligning against the government, it doesn't mean that the corruption case was completely without merit. All this can make Timoshenko's arguments against corruption appear somewhat hollow. Also, while Batkivshina is defined on both English and Ukrainian Wikipedia as populist, in a roundtable discussion in 2019, the party noted that its failure to grow in the parliamentary elections was likely due to the fact that the party failed to embrace populist measures and remained too technical. Finally, Batkivshina is like many Ukrainian parties, lacking any strong ideology, so there tends to be a large amount of division between its members. The next party is a bit more ideologically grounded. Holos, or Voice, is a liberal party. It was founded in 2019 by Ukrainian rock star Svetislav Vakarchuk. It became the fifth most voted for party in Ukraine in the parliamentary elections that year. Most of its vote was concentrated in the West, Kiev, and the diaspora. Its faction in the Rada is also younger and has a higher number of women than other Rada factions, so it may be supported by these groups more. It currently has 20 MPs. It is headed by Kira Rudik, AMP. Holos is a liberal party in the vein of liberal parties in the EU. It is supportive of the EU, wanting Ukraine to join the Union and NATO. It economically is supportive of free market policies, supporting privatization, wants to reduce the bureaucracy, provide more support to startups, wants to balance the state's budget, and wants to incentivize more foreign investment in the economy. It also wants to do more to fight corruption, wants a fully proportional electoral system, and wants to reduce the number of days the Rada is in session. Holos, while it is more ideologically firm than other parties, also suffers from accusations of corruption and division. Actually, at one point in 2021, over half of the party's MPs had left the party because of disagreements with party leadership. It seems that this has been patched up, but it still points to the fact that infighting is present in the party, and it isn't united. Shortly after the election, Varachuk actually left his position as an MP and has largely left the party behind which may partially be the reason the party is suffering from so much infighting, since they have lost their popular figurehead. The party also got the most support in the diaspora in Kiev, which may, like yes, be a sign that they are more supported by the rich, and not get as much support among poor Ukrainians, so they may be seen as elitist. So those are the currently legal parties that passed the 5% threshold last election, so we'll start looking at the more obscure or recently formed parties in the Rada. First, there is Za Maj Budnish, or For the Future Party. The party was formed originally in 2007, but was mostly irrelevant, never really doing well in any election. Then, in 2019, several small parties and individual MPs in the Rada formed a political group in the Rada and merged into the party. The party is seen partially as a continuation of the Ukrainian Association of Patriots, a small nationalist party, and also as a tool for the oligarch, Ihor Kolomuski. The party's website didn't work when I tried to open it, and I suspect it, like the other parties we have talked about, doesn't really have a firm ideology. And I doubt it's really that important in wider Ukrainian politics. It currently has 19 MPs. Another small party is Nashkrai, or Our Land. Our Land is a small party that was formed in 2011. It grew in 2014 after absorbing several ex-members of the Party of Regions, a pro-Russian party that ruled the country from 2010 to 2014. The party is seen as holding a lot of support on the local level in eastern Ukraine, but is very small everywhere else. It seems to be described as a pro-Russian party and or a party representing the interest of eastern Ukraine. 
On its website, it argues for greater powers to local authorities and argues for a socially conservative society while opposing nationalism. During the Russian invasion, several politicians associated with the party were apparently working with the Russian authorities. It currently has three MPs. The next party, while fairly small, is actually somewhat important to wider Ukrainian politics. Svoboda, or Freedom, is a far-right and Ukrainian nationalist party. Svoboda is currently the furthest right party in the Rada, expressing support for Stefan Berda, a Nazi collaborator who massacred thousands of Poles and Jews in World War II, its leader, Oya Tenenyabuk, stating that Ukraine was being directed by a secret Muscovite Jewish mafia, and the party just being extremely chauvinistic. Hi, editing Ryan from the future. Um, I just want to say that Stefan Berda has a little bit of a disputed historical legacy. He both fought with and against the Nazis in World War II. And depending on which historian you ask, they will either downplay or really play up his collaboration with the Nazis. Also, I will later on um, in this section say that Svoboda made big gains in the 2010 election. It was actually the 2012 election. The party came to prominence in the 2010 election, when it won over 10% of the vote, seeing a surge of support in the West due to dissatisfaction with the pro-Russian government, it moderating slightly, and its promise of anti-corruption reforms. In the aftermath of Euromaidan, it briefly served in the government until the 2014 election, when the party went from the fourth most voted for party in the country to getting less than 5% of the vote. In the 2019 election, it aligned itself with several other far-right groups, like the right sector, veterans from the Azov Battalion and the Ukrainian Volunteer Army, and several other groups. They attempted to unite the ultranationalist vote together, but only managed to get a little over 2% of the vote. It did win a constituency in the city of Ivano-Franskitsk, but besides that, failed to make any real gains. Svoboda so brings up an important topic around Ukraine. Russia has accused Ukraine of being full of neo-Nazis. I think Svoboda so proves that far-right parties, while they do exist, are not dominant in Ukraine. Considering Svoboda so had to combine its strength with several other far-right parties, and even then, didn't do very well, shows that the Ukrainian public is not full to the brim of hardcore ultranationalists. Even if you combine that with the vote share of the radical party of Oleh Lieshko, another nationalist and populist party, it is only a little over 6% of the vote going to hardcore Ukrainian nationalists. If we compare that to other states around Ukraine, Russia had roughly 8.5% of its electorate vote for hard-right Russian nationalists in the 2021 election, Romania had a little over 10% vote for hard-right Romanian nationalists, while Slovakia had almost 20% vote for hard-right and even out-and-out -out Nazi parties in 2020, which points to the fact that throughout Europe, hard-right parties exist and have been gaining strength, and it's not a unique Ukrainian phenomenon. Obviously, far-right groups do exist outside of electoral politics, the Azov Battalion being a good example, but I think outside of very pro-Russian circles, I am skeptical most people or academics would label Ukraine as a state wholly controlled by Nazis. Those are all the parties that have somewhat of an ideology slash interesting background. The remaining groups are all quite small and mostly irrelevant, even more so than the past three groups I talked about. There is the parliamentary group that is also trying to form its own party, known as Trust, but information on the group is seemingly limited. There is the Self-Reliance Party, which is a center-right party and became the third most voted for party in the 2014 election, but due to infighting and defections, ended up with only one seat in the 2019 election. There is the Andrei Bolina team, a party representing the political allies of Andrei Bolina, the mayor of Mike Chevel, and there is Bila Tazurka together, a party representing the interests of the city Bila Tazurka. Other parties do exist on the local level, but besides that, those are the parties of Ukraine. It's important to take some time and note that a little over a year ago, a couple weeks after Russia invaded, several parties that were all pro-Russian were banned by the Ukrainian government for allegedly working with the Russian government. Many of these parties were small, mostly irrelevant parties. However, one of those parties that was banned was the Opposition Platform for Life, or OPFL. OPFL was the largest opposition party in the country after the 2019 election, and emerged as a leading party for the Russian-speaking community in Ukraine, getting the most support in the East and somewhat also in the South. It, like the R Land party we talked about earlier, was mostly made up of ex-party of region members, and represented those in Ukraine who wanted a friendly relationship with Russia, autonomy for Russian speakers, and seemingly embrace more status economics. The party was also like many other Ukrainian parties, backed by the oligarchs of the country, although also as a unique twist, it was backed by Russian oligarchs. Very multicultural. 
The party has tried to overturn its ban, and it has formed its own parliamentary group in the Rada, but so far attempts to re-legalize the party have been unsuccessful. It pre-banning had around 30 MPs. It and its rump faction are headed by Yuri Boko, a MP and former vice prime minister. OPFL was banned due to it being accused of being full of collaborators. The party denies this, but it's also not entirely unfounded. One MP from the party praised the invasion and said Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians were all a part of the same nation. Another was said to have been the replacement for Zelensky if overthrown, and wrote an article saying that Russia should go to nuclear war if Europe interferes in the conflict, and several politicians or businessmen associated with the party have all fled the country. While the OPFL before its banning did condemn the invasion and called on Ukrainians to defend their country, the examples I listed before and the fact that it has historically been dovish on Russia means that the party has likely earned a reputation for, at best, being naive, and at worst, being traitors. The party is also, like many other parties in Ukraine, accused of corruption and of holding little ideology. The banning of OPFL brings up accusations that Zelensky is a dictator and is banning all opposition. While it is true that Zelensky has used his wartime powers to crack down on parties and media that is accused of being controlled by Russia, it also is true that Zelensky's targeting of pro-Russian groups isn't entirely universal. So remember, our land is another pro-Russia party, and they weren't banned. OPFL's ex-politicians also aren't all under arrest, and many high-ranking members in the party are still active in Ukrainian politics, operating within the system like the parliamentary group the party has set up. Other opposition parties like YES and Batkivshina exist. Ukrainian politics still have divisions within it. However, it is notable that the largest opposition party, and the opposition party that is debatably the most different from the rest of the other parties in the country, was banned. Also coming back to accusations that the Ukrainian government is heavily influenced by Nazis, it is notable that these pro-Russian parties were banned, but not far-right Ukrainian nationalists. I suppose the big question is what will happen after the war. Politicians using their wartime powers long after the conflict or any reasonable length of time is over to consolidate their control and power and remove dissidents is not uncommon. Ultimately, we will likely have to wait for some time to see if Zelensky reverses on some of these crackdowns. So those are the parties. But before I end, I was asked to speculate how Ukraine joining the EU might actually affect the EU parliament. This next section is going to be a lot of speculation, and right now it seems Ukrainian membership into the EU is a long way off, so just keep all that in mind. So the EU parliament can legally only have a max of 751 members, and currently it has 705 members. Ukraine has a large population of over 40 million, more than Poland, but less than Spain. Poland sends 52 MEPs to EU Parliament, while Spain sends 59. So if Ukraine were to join, it would get somewhere between the two, although this would likely break the 751 rule limit. Ultimately, the rules of the EU Parliament would have to be changed, or the number of MEPs for other states would have to be lowered to let Ukraine into the Union. But where would the party sit in EU Parliament? Many of the large parties have ties to wider European political parties, so we can speculate from that. SN and Holos are members of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, who are in the Renew Europe group, while YES and Bavkivshina are observer parties within the European People's Party, which is a part of the European People's Party group. OPFL isn't affiliated with anyone, so they, or a successor party, might sit by themselves, and while Svoboda is small, it was historically friendly with the National Rally of France and the Alliance of European National Movements which consisted of several other far-right parties, so maybe they would be affiliated with the Identity and Democracy movement, or sit by itself. But we also have to remember that Ukrainian parties aren't homogenous. They typically have many different members who will often break from the party line. A good place to see this is the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, or PACE. PACE is a legislative arm of the Council of Europe, and has around 306 legislators from countries in the EU and outside of it, including Ukraine. The legislators of this group are all members of each member state's parliament, so Ukrainian legislators all are also members of the Rada. The PACE has several political groups similar to EU parliament. To briefly go over each group, there is the SOC, which is a combination of center-left social democrats and green parties, the EPP slash CE, which is made up of broadly center-right conservatives, EC slash DA, which is made up of conservatives and nationalists, ALDE, which is made up of liberals, UEL, which is made up of socialist and leftist, and finally, a non-affiliated group, which is made up of everything else. It is also important to note that since PACE is an informal body, the political groups aren't super ideologically strict. So, for example, the SOC group has the Five Star Movement, the EPP slash CE group has Macedonian Nationalist, the EC slash DA group has the ruling party of Azerbaijan, which is kind of, sort of, conservative, 
And then the ALDE group has Swiss nationalists within it. So where do Ukrainian parties sit in the pace? Well, SN, yes, but Kivshina, Holos, For the Future, Trust, and XOPFL all are present in the pace. Trust sits in the ALDE, while For the Future sits in the EC slash DA group. Holos's two members sit in the ALDE, and Batkivshina's two members sit in the EPP slash CE. Both pretty understandable. However, it starts to get weird with the two XOPFL members who sit in the SOC group. I suppose because they back more status economics, it might make sense, but it's still a little strange. Then Yes's two members are divided. One sits in the ALDE, while the other sits in the EC slash DA. Then we have SN, whose 14 members are divided between three groups. Six sit in the ALDE, five sit in the EC slash DA, and finally three sit in the EPP slash CE. So while sometimes parties do sit with their logical groupings, other times parties just kind of sit randomly or are divided between multiple groups. I think what this really highlights is a point I've been making at several points throughout this episode, that Ukrainian politics and parties are less around ideology and more around just power. So those are the parties of Ukraine. I think the big thing to keep in mind is Ukrainian politics isn't based really around left or right or any big ideological divisions. Out of the 11 parties currently in the Rada, only two, Holos and Svoboda, have a strong ideologies. I suppose also the OPFL might have a strong ideology, but it's their ideology is really just they like Russia. The remaining parties all just have this vague inkling of an ideology, but not like, say, the parties in Greece, where pretty much every party has its own ideological niche, and its party members are generally in the same ideological ballpark. In Ukraine, this is not a case, and having a cohesive ideology is not needed for a party. So, I hope you all enjoyed. Up next, I will do two episodes on the history of China. One is going to be ancient Chinese history, and I'm hoping that will be from like ancient China all the way to the Boxer Uprising. And then the second one will be Boxer Uprising and everything afterwards. And then after that, I will do German political parties. So yeah, thanks for listening, thanks for watching. If you want, you can email me at why do countries exist for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.